for an ontology of a still being. Quoting Turin's The Trouble with Being Born. In paradise, I would not last a season, or even a day. Then how account for my nostalgia for it? I don't account for it. It has inhabited me always. It was part of me before I was born. Ever since the first historical human being lifted their head, times have been stubbornly interesting. Not a day goes by without a disaster. Not a year without novelty. No generation without departures towards hope against one's better judgment. High culture may speak of itself because it moves very much in the element of event. As long as it sets up worlds that want to continue being narrated, it insists on being made from the stuff of heroic epics and novel series. The degree to which high culture is interesting corresponds precisely to the degree of civilizational mobilization. The interesting is the psychological interest rate of the catastrophe. Once the interesting drug called history has grasped the entire psyche, it appears as something we can no longer imagine being without. Overwhelmed by its own movement, the thinking avalanche sets itself in motion, following a self-potentializing dynamic that is peculiar to the subjects of the world process, who are on their way to more power and skill. Where the very historicity of existence becomes unfastened, it takes on the structure of a history-making history. It continually acquires its agents, through which it continually keeps going and casts itself forward as an increasingly heightened way. That is why the essential historical consciousness is not so much defined by traditionalism, which essentially remains ahistorical, but the tradition of mobilization. History organises itself like a rally in time, which searches for its route from stage to stage, even if it often gets the impression that there is no more path to continue on. The history-making teams have fallen as willfully as the suicidal mob of the Paris-Dakar rally. Frenetically, they are on their way from Babylon to Megalopolis, and time and again they find their manic whisperers indulging them in the idea of being race leaders and sponsors in the formidable enterprise. Prophets, philosophers of history, moralists, theorists of learning, great men of the highest mission. Just as the interesting is the psychological interest rate of the catastrophe, so too are the missions its loans. Where history has begun as a self-fulfilling mission, the not-yet structure begins to reign, mobilising life with unfulfilled orders. The mission dynamic constitution of essential history condemns any historically achieved state of affairs to embarrass itself before what has not yet been achieved. Everything that is now is latently destroyed by being measured against what is still to come, because the appearance of the not yet being always prevails for the utopian missionary gaze of current beings. The real is degraded to the mere appearance of a being that first has arrived in order to exist. The already arrived is obliterated by the not yet fulfilled. In the process, the insatiable hunger for the future grows. The ontology of the not yet being, magnificently defined by Ernst Bloch, gives away the secret of the historical mobilization of the world. It outlines an ontology. It outlines an ontology of the becoming being, which determines the world process as a genre drama, that lifts itself upwards to the highest light motifs. This, pro this processes from within itself the agents, engines, and motivations as a byproduct, through which it can then launch itself into even further spaces of not yet being. As the ontology of the revolutionary world movement blocks teaching, which has not yet become a utopian goal, rationalizes world history as a space of increase in an infinite mission. Where the world was, God should become. But because the real world must never be directly divine, but at most provide the initial letter of the divine name, the becoming God of the world is at the same time given to infinite postponement. Thus the currently real ontologically find itself in a quandary. Thus the currently real ontologically finds itself in a quandary, 
as a comprising of. It is obsolete and devalued from the outset. As a mobilisation-making mass, it is placed at the disposal of benefiting, accelerated improvements, which time and again lead to the incorrigible. In the ontology of not yet being, the restlessness of historical injured life is theorised as a history-making hope. With the help of a mission ontological boost, the driveness the drivenness transforms itself into promise and charges back into itself as a will to non-release. It is this self-drive which turns suffering from reality into an engine for the departure into the new world of modern times. If the ontological definition of modern times as a being towards movement has become universal for us in this matter, it is due to the fact that modern times are synonymous with the phenomenon that it is only a few centuries ago that enterprising humans were able to achieve an effective interconnection of mission motifs and technical success machines. The success which triggered avalanches of further success meanwhile spins over into its own successes. Since the beginning of modern times, historical acceleration phenomena have experienced a nuclear-like increase. This means nothing more than that the self-intensification loops responsible for modern mobilisations have become conclusive on a broad front in recent centuries. Only when imagination principally imagines itself as in the transcendental philosophies, the will wills itself, as in the pragmatic power ontologies. Productivity is produced, as in the liberal or socialistically motivated industrial systems, and creativity is created, as in the psychotechnical simulation of ingenious obsessions. Only then will history makers be systematically launched and mobilizers published in series. These dangerously multiplied perpetrators are increasingly responsive to each other and to their offensive projects and campaigns. The events generated by them condense into a catastrophic jelly. The apparent learning process is turning into a real nuclear process. The further this escalates, the more desperate the old Enlightenment affirmations sound, which claim that humanity today still moves within a prehistory of itself. History's conception as an infinite mission now forces its agents into great bold positions. While most signs in the world point to a not long now, they must stubbornly hold on to the still not yet. But maybe they're right. Between the previous not yet and the imminent no more, we poor interim devils are only left with the unhappy awareness that we have always lived in the wrong time. We are too late for the first paradise, and too early for the second. A history that can, until the last, only be a prehistory of fulfilled times is for us no other time, is nothing other than a lost time. A history that can, until the last, only be a prehistory of fulfilled times is for us nothing other than a lost time. What was claimed at the beginning of the book on modernity what it represents, the paradoxical program to carry out an infinite project on a finite basis, can now be said about history as a whole, insofar as it proceeds in an anthropogenic exodus, as a utopian way home and an apocalyptic mobilisation. The history-making tension between the design and the foundation, between the driving and the persisting, is not only based on the non-relationship between the finite and to the infinite, the utopian and the topical, Far more powerfully effective in it is the act of confusing the memory of an intrauterine, a cosmically blessed existence with the anticipation of an extrauterine, worldly real, universal happiness. In the historical, ontological phantasm of the self illuminating not yet, an a cosmic part is projected onto a cosmic future. The intrauterine dowry is hallucinated as an outer defiant world. But then history can be nothing other than the endless birth struggle of a phantasmagorical human body that is abandoned by the inner motherly homeland and exposed to non-motherly foreignness. There it has to throw itself into the enterprise of turning the foreign into a home. But the foreign never quite wants to be the same as that which is our own and our home. 
because the acosmic cannot be realised in the cosmic, because worldless limbo is never the result of worldwide effort, the historic departure towards the realisation of the real home must be an extermination campaign against the immediately present, cosmic, outer, others. The matricide, undertaken to extort a return to the womb, is the logical and objective consequence of this world historical directive of the experimentum mundi. Once the a-cosmic character of the utopian ideal becomes clear, we can see through the temporal logical deception upon which the ontology of the not-yet-being rests. The miraculous pull of the very other, that storm from paradise that drives into the wings of Walter Benjamin's angel of history, comes from a place that does not lie before us, but behind us. That is why today's search for the future is a catastrophic misunderstanding. The paradise political raid of nature as raw material which does not know how things happen to it. Paradise now. This cannot be achieved with the nature that is given, but also not as empty dreams of soul would claim without nature. The dream of a better life means a long last, in toto, a new world. That is again a setting. A cosmic country. As soon as the deception is lifted, the temporal sense of the utopian changes. It is not something towards us from the future. Rather, it is the light of the still that is cast from an undeniably given life also into the ungiven. That is why the still is more powerful than the not yet. The power of utopia belongs less to the self-illuminating becoming of something better than to the still itself luminiferous still being of what has been begun. Nothing is revealed within it, but it has an afterglow. From this correction onward, no one can get near the utopian small town if they approach it as if it were something that has yet to be opened. The utopian place can only be arrived at by a turn back into the still open. Those who come into the still open are not pursuing something distant, but allow themselves to be caught up with by the unreachably near. In the still being, the true spirit of utopia blows, which must not want its own realisation without misunderstanding itself. Freed from the illusions of attainment, the incomparable unplace proves to be a resting point. Because utopia can no longer be thought of as a goal or a mission statement, the previously mobilising itself now becomes the seat of demobilisation. Only those who know what it means to have nothing left to do have a criterion for the right mobility. Instead of mass mobilisations forward, fully movable floating in the here and now becomes possible. The way of critique passes over into a critique of the way. The not yet achieved gets to know the truly achievable and the still being. Thus, the idea of critique must be based on a newly understood spirit of utopia. In doing so, critique as ability to make a difference discovers its premise and the possibility of having nothing to critique. The difference between difference and non-difference sets the quote-unquote more thoughtful thinking in motion, which can stay moving even if the totality theoretical phantasm of an identification of identity and non-identity should prove unfeasible. As critiquing subjects, we are not only the bearers of the ability to make distinctions, but rather much more still those who are themselves differentiated and who think from a place of separation, only because we, as differentiated ones, as individualized spirits, can presuppose the fetal non-differentiation as are we as born subjects, differentiation component. However, the first difference, which makes a distinction as such, is due not to the use of discernment, but to the miraculous catastrophe of the coming into the world. While monistic metaphysicians absorb the absolute into a fetal imagination in order to absorb the worldly other into the worldless one, dramatic critique follows the coming into the world of that which thinks. On the screen of fetal remembrance, it carries on the adventure of being different. That is why a real critical theory, should it exist one day, will be identical to authentic mysticism. 
as a living difference between worldlessness and worldliness, the unique, the unique existence will become aware of its being in the world. The spirit of cosmopolitanism will come to see itself as an enlightened a-cosmism. Only the mystical path will then still be open. As a critique of the path, it leads to where we are. <laughs>